Um, hi everyone, I am uh, Emmanuel. I think you have my name and email at the bottom. Uh, I work, I'm a data scientist for a startup who just launched in Singapore, we call Omnistream. We're not super famous, you'll probably never hear of us because we're very uh, B2B, so don't worry about that. Um, but I used to work for another company before and this relates that experience. Um, it was a company very much, I won't disclose the name uh, because it was not a really good experiment. Um, but uh, it was a company very much focused on web stuff. So we're trying to acquire a lot of traffic from the web, turn that into, like, convert that into uh, sales for someone else, and then sell the lead to someone else, and then get a commission out of that. Uh, it was a bit of a cash machine, which is part of the, the presentation, because we had a really large budget for Amazon. So as a, as a data scientist, it, it was kind of interesting to work with them. Uh, and today we're going to talk about data wrangling, that is getting all that data that comes from all those providers uh, and trying to push that into a consistent uh, single source of truth, like we like to call, uh, but it's a bit fancy. We really just want to put everything into a data warehouse, so then we can start working on it, we can start actually doing some data mining, some reporting, BI and stuff like that uh, on the data. So the kind of source of truth we have where Google Analytics Premium, uh, it's the same than Google Analytics, except that it's a lot more expensive, but you get to get your own data points. Uh, if you use Google Analytics, you just get aggregated information. Uh, with Google Analytics Premium, you get every single like little data point um, you get. AdWords, double click, Facebook, um, and some ad hoc stuff here and there uh, for like CRM, for call center data. Um, and uh, yeah, the task was to put everything into a single data warehouse. A uh, bit more details, for each provider, we split that into four uh, tasks. The first one is to fetch whatever data the provider gives us and put it as it is in our data lake. So that if something goes wrong, if the provider is shut down or something, we can always get the, the data they send us at the time. Uh, and if we improve our process later on, we can always replay the whole process afterward. Um, and so we just pushed everything to S3. I only have really good things to say about S3. It's a really excellent product. I mentioned that because I don't have so many good things to say about other products, but we'll, we'll touch on that. Um, <laughs> then the next step is to normalize the data. So basically take everything that's in our data lake and make it like fit for our one purpose. So we, we just transform everything into data that we like to read, uh, basically uh, a data format that we designed. Um, and then we push everything to a data warehouse. Today we're going to use Redshift. Again, really good product. Uh, and then inside Redshift, we can do a bunch of ETL, but that, that's not really the point of the topic because once it, it's in the data warehouse, we, we're all set, we're good. Um, that's the easy part. All right, pulling data from the provider is by far the most annoying task ever. Uh, if people tell you data science is like glamour and don't believe that, it's mostly dealing with really crappy data sets. Um, every publisher feels like they need to have their own data format. For example, double click there, you know, in comma separated value files, usually you use a comma or a tab or something. In double click, they use the thorn sign, which is the uh, old English for like a letter in old English that's in them. Anyway, um, even the good one, you'd expect Google's to be uh, quite great at that. Uh, they change the schema every other day, which makes it quite hard to follow. For that defense, that also means they improve the product every other day, but it just makes it quite hard for us to follow double click manage to mix this encoding in a single file. That is brilliant. You have some Latin one in a file and then you have some like BIG, something the Hong Kong Chinese um, characters in a single file. It's brilliant. It's, it's just a horrible mess to pass. Um, and on top of that, we have a bunch of uh, like custom uh, data source uh, that some of them don't provide an API. So we managed to get the data through SQL injection. So they were all, all like partner, so we, we could do that. <laughs> it was not illegal, but still, that, that's how we managed to get the data out of them. Anyway, that's the really annoying part. It has little to do with AWS. It's just to point like the, the kind of thing we were doing. Um, we put everything in S3, and we go from there. Normalizing the data is an uh, embarrassingly parallel problem, because you can basically look at every row independently, and you can just normalize row by row. So you can normalize a million rows by a million rows. It's just the same. It really doesn't matter. And so MapReduce, um, I don't know how familiar you are with it, but you surely heard of that. Um, it, it fits quite well, even if we don't really need the reduce part, just the map part. Mapping is basically going row by row and like changing the, changing the results, right? Uh, the good stuff is that we had more or less unlimited budget. The, the company was poorly managed. Um, so we decided, okay, let's go for the expensive stuff and, and use that. For the anecdote, the, 
we had a 10,000 US dollar Elasticsearch cluster per month. Elasticsearch cluster just to, <laughs> just to pull the leads coming from the internet, <laughs> a part of that, which is a really bad use of Elasticsearch and a really bad use of 10,000 US dollars, but whatever. Um, so we want to use Elastic Map Reduce, which is a fancy uh, AWS tool that allows you to basically pop a cluster to run a bunch of like big data uh, tasks. So I, I put the description, you don't have to read it. The point is, it throws in a lot of buzzwords, uh, notably uh, Spark, uh, which we decided to use. Um, if anything, if you really have to use Spark, uh, Elastic Map Reduce is a really good product. But my point today is you probably don't need to use Spark. Um, so that being said, S3 will behave as a Hadoop cluster. If you're not familiar with Hadoop, it's basically a distributed file system. Uh, and EMR will uh, behave like the Spark intent that just scan your Hadoop cluster and parallelize everything and does the bit of data transformation and then spits it out to your, the rest of your Hadoop cluster. So for our task, the normalization part, EMR will automatically split our data set, like all the rows together in how many cluster instances we ask for, do the little bit of processing for the normalization and spit that out back into S3. Really cool use case. Uh, EMR is good, well Spark is good for computation with a lot of caveats, but it's good for computation. Um, in our case, the computation is quite limited because we're really just reading rows and normalizing them. The downside is EMR is quite expensive. Actually, I looked at it yesterday. It's not that expensive anymore, but at the time it was quite pricey. But mostly it was horribly buggy. Like if you wanted to run Spark on EMR, you actually had to monkey patch the instance. So you spawn the cluster, and the first thing you do is you run a bash script on all the, the nodes of the cluster to uh, change some like Java variable that was uh, botched and uh, you replace a binary. It, it, it's quite funny because it was pushed to production. Uh, I can probably still pinpoint to the AWS forum developer question on that. It's like, why is it not working? And the uh, GitHub uh, resolution issue on like totally uh, unrelated product to get it to work. Anyway, the, the main problem is that it was crazy slow. The, the bottleneck in our application was mostly the data transfer because we get gigabytes of data every day from uh, all the providers. Um, and so although the computation was fine, it was just overkill computation wise because you have to launch a master node and then some like slave nodes that do the actual computation and the master node just split the uh, completely overkill. Um, the other problem, it's not really a problem, but Hadoop and Spark is like uh, Java um, virtual machine based. I have nothing for against Java. Okay, I do have things against Java. <laughs> but uh, we use Scala and Scala is cool. I really enjoy Scala. Uh, it's not for everyone. Um, I'm not advocating for Scala, but I had, to, I had fun using it. Uh, which means that the development is quite slow. Anyway, we trashed all of that. Uh, we spent three months doing that. It was just, it was just not cool. Um, so instead, we, we completely rewrote the whole thing. And instead of having how to write Scala task, we just wrote a small Python script that will run on small EC2 instance. Like by small EC2 instance, I'm talking like the um, the smallest one, like not the nano one, but the what's after that, micro one. Yeah. Um, we defined a data exchange format. So if you use Spark, if you use those things, you'll have to use the Apache format like Avro and Pocket and stuff like that. They're probably good, but they don't really fit on it. We just use a stupid uh, gzip CSV file that is the CSV file, you know, it has the header at the top, let's say is the name of the columns. We just encoded the schema of the column, so it must buy to this is an integer, this is uh, a string, this is a string of no longer than that, that can be null or something. Really super simple. And then you gzip that, which has the advantage of being streamable. That is, if you only have half of the file, it's fine. You can resume afterward. You can keep going because it's not a binary format. Um, well, it is, but uh, it's streamable. Um, and you can just get the beginning of the file to just get the header and make sure that everything is fine. So you can do all your consistency check like really quickly. Uh, and it's also quite efficient, like in terms of processing power. You don't have to decode everything. In terms of uh, volume of data, it's quite like if you use JSON. Every time you have something, um, you have a field, you have to name that field, then the value. Name the field, name the value. In CSV, you just do it at the top once and you go. I'm not even talking about XML. Um, anyway, uh, so we do that. We read the data and we push it to Redshift. It is crazy cheaper and crazy faster. And because of the way it's built, uh, it's just small Python scripts. It's also really easy to scale. Uh, because you don't really have to parallelize that much. You say, okay, you focus on that task, you focus on that task, you focus on that task, um, and it, it works almost transparently. In fact, we did the parallelization 
layer with Bash. Uh, and it's a very reliable infrastructure. I mean, S3 is excellent product. EC2 is an excellent product, but that's, uh, you know that. Redshift is a really good product. Uh, and one of the problems with tasks like that, you may be wondering, why are we redoing all that? Surely there's a product that exists to do something like that. Not really. We search for it. But because all the um, data input was so specific and, and so crappy, to be honest, uh, you can't find a provider that has them all and will push them for you. So we had to write all of that, especially like the ad hoc custom call center stuff. Um, and for that reason, because everything sucks quite a lot, uh, you want to develop quite quickly. And so Python is great for that because you just write the normalization step as, okay, this is the input. You do your Python magic. This is the output. Boom, it works. If you have to do that in Java because everything is typed, um, it will take you forever, absolutely forever. And again, computing power is not really an issue, even, even if Python is quite all right. So that was, that was the main choice. You really accelerated the speed of our development. So at the end of the day, this is what we used. Uh, we used S3 for Data Lake. Again, really excellent product. EC2, excellent product. Uh, we used AWS Data Pipeline, uh, which I don't know if you're familiar with it, but it basically allows you to like, connect tasks together. Um, and it's OK, because it can notably spawn the EC2 instance we want and then run the script we want on them at a given time. Uh, so that, that worked quite well. Beyond that, it's a, it's a bit of a main product because you still, at the time, we had like weird error messages that are not documented anywhere, and we couldn't ask anywhere so because we didn't have a, how do you call that, the uh, call center, uh, Amazon help uh, desk or something because they refused to pay for that, so whatever. Um, so AWS Data Pipeline, it works, but I wouldn't expect too much of it. Uh, we used SNS for notification of reporting. That's pretty brilliant as well. And Redshift, I can't emphasize what a good product it is. Nowadays, people want to use uh, NoSQL database, uh, want to do, use Hadoop and Spark, but I, I guess I uh, hammered that nail uh, a bit. Um, Redshift is based on PostgreSQL. It's a great database engine. It has a few quirks. That is, Redshift is a really good analytic database, so it's really good to do like small computation on really large amount of data. Uh, it's not really good if you want to do like when an application database would do like connect stuff and do joint and have like complicated relationships in your table and extract and uh, because you can't, the index is, is built in a, in a completely different way. In fact, you don't really have index. You just, you just define the way your data is um, ordered in the thing, in the, in the tables. Python for any scripting programming and some bash. If you don't use Python, really, you should. It's the best language ever uh, by far. And GZIP CSV, again, don't believe the hype. Uh, there are a lot of formats for data everywhere. Uh, surely we've all used JSON, and JSON is quite a good format. Hopefully, we stopped using XML because XML was not good. Uh, <laughs> but don't, don't, uh, CSV is like old as computing, and it still holds really well. Stuff that didn't make it, uh, Elastic Map Reduce, um, for the reasons I mentioned. Spark and Hadoop, the problem, and I guess this is. This is the, um, one of the take-home message. I think I have a slide that's called take-home message. Um, you probably don't need EMR, and you surely don't need Hadoop and Spark. If you have, OK, today, just like literally today, I picked up a hard drive with 600 gigabytes of pictures. Uh, I will need Hadoop to process that. Um, because it's unstructured data, it's all over the place. I'll upload all that to S3. It's going to take me days just to do that. But then everything will run smoothly with Hadoop and Spark. But if you just want to do normal data transformation, if you have structured data coming, you're wasting your time, you're wasting your money uh, using Hadoop and Spark. So you probably already bought a Hadoop and Spark cluster. So it's too bad. <laughs> Try to get your money back. Um, and data normalization is quite a hostile environment. Um, if you actually work with external provider, any kind of provider you have will have the different crappy way of giving you data. And so you need something agile to be able to process that data efficiently and push it to something that you can process, something that looks like all the other data that you have. Uh, and that's something you can't, uh, you can't get away with. You have to do that. And it has to be custom development. Uh, and you don't need any fancy Apache data format. Python is the best. Postgres is the best. And that's it. Um, so we're quite new. Um, we, we still do a lot of data wrangling, but it's fun now because I'm in charge. Um, we're looking for people. So if you don't like Hadoop, uh, if you really like Python, uh, if you like, uh, we have some former Gen Suite people. So if you're into OCaml, uh, we, really, we really like that. Uh, if you hate building web crude apps, 
uh, just send me a note. Uh, I'll be happy to have a chat with you. And uh, that's it for me. Recently, you're quite new here in Singapore, you just came from Hong Kong, right? Yes. Um, I welcome Emmanuel, it's really great to have some Hong Kong refugees. <laughs> you're in Singapore, you're free, you're free. Yes. But um, on a serious note, somewhat serious, who does data mining in this group? Uh, just raise your hands, like uh, analytics data, come on, you must use, someone must use data mining here. Well, I can, I can, <laughs> I do. <laughs> well, anyway, the AWS platform is pretty awesome for big data and all that rest of it. Um, it's certainly better than my USB 3 hard drive, um, which has given me a lot of hassles. <clears throat> Any questions from Emmanuel? Uh, what industries are you guys in? I think they all have a Hadoop cluster and they're like, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> Massively, uh, stupidly uh, parallel jobs. What do you use if, if not EMR? Oh, it turns that that you can. It's so easy to parallelize that you just have to split your data set, which takes like no time at all. What well, do you mean? You just write a script to do the parallelization or something? What do you mean? Yeah, you just say. Well, you just look at all the files that you have in your data lake, and you spawn like you say, I want to spawn 20 nodes, and you ask tw the 20. Oh. Sorry, not 20 nodes. 20 scripts that will run in parallel, and you just instruct every script to take like a part of that. Yeah, it's it's very. You don't have, the, the heavy weight, uh, you don't have any kind of uh, concurrency issue or yeah, stuff like that. You can that just. Makes, uh, that makes sense. Any questions? Three, two, one. Well, you can always ask them a bit later. Uh, thanks again, Emmanuel. Thank you.